one. Okay, we can start. So, good evening, all, and on behalf of the Maltese Young Christian Workers, and in collaboration with Newsbook, I have the pleasure to welcome you to the first lecture of this Cardane Lecture Series. My name is Justin Kirkhoff, and I'm a member of the Maltese Young Christian Workers. Claims made by extreme free marketeers about Catholic social teaching require us to take another look at the uneasy relationship between Catholicism and capitalism. Capital markets have become the new temples of the capitalist system, very often substituting politics in the same way that individualism has substituted personhood. In his encyclical, Centesimus Annus, John Paul II offered a force for reflection on unbridled, unbridled capitalist system. Throughout its history, the Maltese young Christian, Christian workers has always endeavored to put the human person and in, its inherent dignity at the center of its economic and political proposals. In these times of unbridled capitalism, it is high time that we should bring this issue to the fore of our agenda. For this reason, I am delighted to introduce Professor Stefano Zamani, who will be delivering tonight's lecture entitled A Christian Critique of the Capitalist System. Professor Zamani is a professor of economics at the University of Bologna and adjunct professor of international political economy at John Hopkins University Bologna Center. His research interests include civil economy, welfare economics, theory of consumer behavior, social choice theory, economic epistemology, ethics, and history of economic thought. In 2013, Pope Francis appointed Professor Zamani a member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, while in March 2019, the Pope appointed him president of the same academy. He is also a member of both the Pontifical Council on Justice and Peace and of the Scientific Committee of the Pontifical Council for Culture. <clears throat> and now some housekeeping notices. During the lecture, your, micro your microphones will be muted. However, you are encouraged to send any questions you have on the lecture using the Zoom chat function. After the lecture, we will have 10 to 15 minutes when Professor Zamani will answer questions which you would have sent us during the lecture. We want to also to inform you that this lecture is being recorded, and should you have problems following this Zoom session, this le session, this lecture is also being streamed on both the ZHN and Newsbook Facebook pages. And now, dear Professor Zamani, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me express my gratitude to Father Joe Inguanet for the invitation, which I accepted the very very happily. Now, uh, let me uh, first of all uh, say that uh, I visited uh, your beautiful island several times, and I've always been impressed by the level of uh, dedication that you devoted to culture. And uh, the topic of uh, tonight, uh, it's a peculiar one, even though I will uh, follow not so much a theological approach, but an economic approach, which is the subject uh, that I cultivate, uh, as uh, of course uh, you know, and as the presenter said. And let me start uh, from a quotation by David Brooks, the columnist uh, of the New York Times, uh, who recently wrote, I quote, a society is healthy when its culture counterbalances its uh, economics. When you have a capitalist economic system that emphasizes competition, dynamism, individual self-interest, you need a culture that celebrates cooperation, stability, and committed relationship. On the other hand, our culture today takes the disruptive and dehumanizing aspects of capitalism and makes them worse, unquote. If you pay attention, this is a remarkable quotation coming from a journalist because he got exactly the point. The point is um, not so much with what happens with capitalism per se, but what is happening with our culture. Because what we lack today is a counterbalance. It, it, so it is important to stress this point because many people believe that um, if we could uh, change the system, but unless we change the culture, 
there is nothing to be done. Before uh, going ahead, entering into the, my topic, let me clarify a point of central relevance, which is uh, almost often forgotten. Of course, uh, the major responsibility is of the economists who never clarify what uh, they use uh, in their uh, argumentation or in their papers, etc. The point is that the new technological paradigm could in principle make everybody better off, uh, provided that there is a sufficient political will. So that is the point. Today we lack political will. Now, what is uh, the, what lies at the bottom of this fact? As you know, the economic effects uh, of the new technologies, the so-called um, technologies associated to the fourth industrial revolution, can be decomposed into two parts. The first one is that uh, the new technology raise overall output, which is and in fact uh, wealth and global income in the last few decades continue to increase. And that this extra output is earned by someone in the economy. But then there is also the second effect that the, the, the new technologies also generate a redistribution of the economic pie as it changes the market prices at which people transact in the economy. In other words, the process associated uh, to the new technology is not only a factor determining an increase uh, of the size of the pie, uh, which everybody underlies, but also modifies uh, the redistribution. And the redistribution via price changes is always uh, a zero sum gain, which means what you obtain, I lose. Now, this is what is called the uh, in uh, economic theory, pecuniary externality. Now, if you want to bet with me, ask an economist, even professors, if they know about pecuniary externalities. Most of them would answer, I never heard, or I don't know. That is the tragedy. Because if we talk about the technological externalities, everybody knows. What is the typical example of a technological externality? Pollution. If I at the factor I pollute, I generate a negative technological externality because that effect can be observed and can be measured. On the other hand, the pecuniary externalities are those consequences of an economic action that operate via the price mechanism. In other words, changing what is called the structure of relative prices. Consider a typical example of food, which occurred in the year 2009, after, immediately after the financial crisis. What happened was that the stock exchange of Chicago the, uh, allowed the, the, uh, the, 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 the derivatives issued the, the, uh, based on the price of fundamental commodities such as grain, rice, etc. Speculation in the time span of few months more than double the price of these fundamental items, such as I said, rice, grain, and similar. So the poor people whose income has remained more or less the same, of course, they had to starve because if you double the price, it is obvious that you have to half the quantity bought and consumed. Now, in the, when that occurred, people said, but we did not want to uh, influence the life conditions of people living in India or uh, in Southeastern Asia or in Africa. We did our job, uh, speculation. And in, as you know, Obama, he was the president, immediately issued a decree whereby it was forbidden since then to speculate on the prices of commodities. But that occurred after a major disaster occurred. That is only one example. So pecuniary externalities are invisible. It's not like technological externalities. 
that can be seen. If there is a smoke out of the chimney of my factory, everybody can detect it, etc. So it is obvious to conclude on this point, if we only care about efficiency and not equity, it is obvious that pecuniary externalities have to be ignored. That is why economists typically never talk, because for the typical economist, or better to say mainstream economist, the only economic problem is efficiency. What does it mean efficiency? Increasing the size of the pie, increasing what is called GDP or any other measure. But if you take equity also as, a, as well as efficiency into consideration, it is obvious that you cannot forget about the pecuniary externalities. Now, this is a point of clarification, which is needed because most people behave as if they were not in existence. The same is true with what happens uh, when, the, for instance, uh, during the pandemic with the GAFAM. GAFAM is the acronym which stands for Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and Microsoft. There are five giants, in all of them from California. Now, during the pandemic, they increased uh, their profits simply because as a consequence of the pandemic, people had to interact among themselves via a distance or via webinars. Or one time. So they increased the selling of their product in a manner in a, that was unbelievable. But that is not a, a merit of those companies, simply because they took advantage of, a, 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 in this case, a critical factor like a pandemic without contributing to cope with it. Now, I move, having said so, if the goal is to move ahead towards a different kind of economy, one that is inclusive and not exclusive, humane and not dehumanized, an economy that cares for the environment, not despoiling it. If that is the goal, what should be done? In other words, what Catholic social teaching, or better to say Christian social teaching, because it's not only Catholic Church, but many other churches, such as the Anglican Church, or even uh, in a different way, Orthodox Church, etc. In other words, what should be proposed if the target is not only to increase efficiency, but also to increase uh, the rate of fairness in the economy. And by fairness mean to allow everybody to develop his or her potential. Now, let me indicate a few, five, not because they are the only policies, but they, in my opinion, are the five, uh, let's say, decisions which are mostly urgent to be implemented. The first one, has to do with the still prevalent mood in economics based on the wrong concept of value. Because if you talk to common people and say, what is value for you? The answer is value is identified with market price. Now, that is the most terrible mistakes that can be, again, the major fault goes to the economists because they keep on writing textbooks which are wrong, which are wrong. I know all the textbooks <laughs> because I, I am a teacher myself. Because one thing is the notion of value, another thing is the notion of market price. And so, such a reductionist notion of value has many consequences for the way the economic system bye is bye. structured. For instance, for instance, relational goods, uh, care goods. Uh, commons, you know what are the commons, are not public goods, gratuitousness goods, etc., do not enter the metric of GDP. GDP includes only the market price or, or the, 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 the goods which have a market price. But you know what is a relational good or a care good. But what is the price of a smile 
offered to somebody who is in bed in an hospital. Can you attach a price to that? On the other hand, can you deny that that act has a value? So that is uh, the first point. Uh, Christian social teaching urges us to modify the metric according to which GDP is measured. There is a famous quotation by John Maynard Keynes, a great British economist, as you know. Now, in his uh, essays in Persuasion, he wrote, I quote, it is a fantastic quote, we shall once more value and above means and prefer the good to the useful. Can you imagine a British economist? Don't forget that uh, utilitarianism was born in Britain. Mm, you know that utilitarian philosophy is a exclusive British invention, which spread elsewhere in the world later. But they, and Keynes said that we should prefer the good to the useful. Useful has to do with the utility. So that is a. Uh, uh, we should abandon our instrumentalist orientation where means get all our attention and the ends virtually none and focus on what makes people truly happy. That is the first, uh, let's say, measure of policy or even better to say the, the first uh, strategy to be pursued. Second, companies, need to embrace a sense of purpose beyond making only profits. On this, nowadays, the literature is rather, uh, I would say, abundant, but it's proper to remind it of that. In other words, uh, companies, they have to consider the well-being of all the stakeholders, not only of the shareholders. You know, there is a long story which was um, started with famous uh, Friedman, Milton Friedman, uh, um, declaration to the in an interview to the New York Times in the year uh, 1970, when he said there is only one social responsibility of companies to maximize profits. Of course, uh, Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winner in economics, he, he knew because uh, he emphasized which condition should be followed in order to give to such a sentence a meaning. But what happened is that the followers who were brought, and again, that is another scandal of most economists, because they followed the expression by Milton, by Friedman, without paying attention to the conditions. I don't know if in the audience there are economists, but you know what is a variation economic system. He was referring to a general economic equilibrium variation type. In that case, it is true what he said. But since the world does not fit that model, it is obvious that his statement has no meaning at all. And still, even nowadays, there are people repeating that story. And that is terrible because that means that ignorance is terrible. When people are ignorant, they keep on making fuss and spreading fake truth. Fake truth, not fake news. Now, today, enlightened business leaders are understanding that focusing on maximizing shareholder value has no future. The tendency is to move toward what is called a total societal impact. Keep that in mind, that this is an expression that in the near future will become rather, rather common. Today is not yet come. Total societal impact, according to which companies as cognitive institutions are considering the impact of their activities on the social and environmental dimension, as well as on the proper economic one. In this regard, there is a, a real paradox characterizing the business world. And that is a very serious. I don't know if you are familiar with um, big business and with the CEO, chief executive officers 
of major companies. But uh, if you are familiar, you know that they are suffering a lot because they are suffering of a, a major contradiction. And what is the contradiction? The following, that the golden rule of managerial culture is the prohibition to mix language and the emotions of private life with those uh, that belong to the business life. In other words, uh, the idea is when you enter the business, you have to forget about your identity. Never mind if you are a father or a mother, if you have children or not, if your children are okay or not, etc. Once you enter your office or your laboratory, whatever, you have to identify yourself with the, the firm, the company for which you are working. And so words such as gift, gratitude, uh, friendship, mercy, or fraternity, they are banned in the workplace since they are considered improper. But here is the contradiction. On the other hand, when the same business managers, top executives, they have to hire new people, they pretend that the new people will exhibit a sense of fairness, a sense of loyalty, blah, 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 not cheating, etc. But that even a child would admit that it is a contradiction, because you cannot pretend that the people you are hiring should be morally okay, and then when they start working, you ask them to forget about their moral or religious identity. The two things cannot stay together. So that is why the new capitalism of this epoch has uh, discovered this contradiction. And that explains why in many countries, Italy included, I don't know so much about Malta, but uh, there are, this, the situation are changing. I don't know if you know the famous declaration of two years ago by the Economic Roundtable of the United States, when uh, more than 130 CEO signed up the famous declaration. Okay, a third point is the following. It is urgent to rewiring finance, which requires that the financial accounting system include the social and environmental metrics, and that the impact investing becomes a norm of behavior. Now, a point should be made clear in this context. The pursuit of profit is not the problem per se, as many people believe. Don't get confused. The, prob the real problem is in the incompleteness of the profit calculation, namely what is left out. Because the, the fact that a firm should make profit is obvious, obvious. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not talk about uh, economic reality. What is not obvious is the way you calculate profit. And the omissions are today unbearable. For instance, they never it is considered what I said before, technological externalities. If I pollute, why I do not include in my balance sheet the cost that I have created the polluting because I did not want to put filters in my machineries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. The real problem today is not to make a war against profit, as certain people, perhaps in bona fide, say, but they are ideological. The real problem is to say profit is okay, provided that when you draw the balance sheets and the difference between cost and revenues, etc., in order to determine profit, because profit is revenues minus cost. So what we should ask that in the cost calculations, also the hidden and indirect costs are determined. That is uh, the point. We record the value of what we harvest from nature, but make no matching entry for its degradation. If we could do that, you can be sure that uh, the tremendous extra profits 
of many giant company would disappear. Fourth, a fourth line of action has to do with the role of governments. Now, governments need to reaffirm their fundamental role in fixing the rules of the economic game in view of the common good and not for the interest of particular groups of actors. Because without rules, globalization becomes a jungle. What is today? The global market poses pro problems, not because of globalization again, but of the way globalization is managed. In other words, um, it is not acceptable an economy in which the market and political powers allow privileged individuals and businesses to extract a great deal of rent from everybody else. This is the so-called extractivist attitude, which has no, no meaning from an economic point of view, because a, a proper, a true economist knows knows that rents are always dangerous to the development process because rents is not the same thing as profits and uh, uh, wages. But what is more, we democracies have to make a decision. And the decision is between two alternative concepts of global economic governance. The a concept that Daniel, Daniel Roderick, an American economist, a rather famous, has called one globalization enhancing global governance. The other one, democracy enhancing global governance. We have to make a decision. And so far, at the international level, nothing has been said. Why? Because China prefers the first one. For China, Globalization is, uh, a, sorry, global governments is uh, to be uh, targeted at enhancing globalization per se. On the other hand, democratic countries, they want a global government, a global governance, which is aimed at democracy enhancing, which means uh, in poor words, when we talk about uh, free trade, blah, 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 et cetera, what is the ultimate target? The ultimate target is to increase even more the globalization process or we want to democratize because trade can be used in other way. We can use trade in order to increase the democratic rule or we can use trade in order to favor the interest of autocratic government. And that is a decision which has to be taken at the international level, in particular the WTO, World Trade Organization. And uh, some people say, oh, that is not, uh, why it is not possible? Who can say so? Because it, it is obvious that originally the World Trade Organization, when it was created after the Second World War, it was decided by a group of politicians representing, in that case, the winning powers, etc. I know that today is more difficult, but to more, more difficult does not mean that it is impossible. In this sense, what the critical concept is the one expressed by John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, when in his encyclical letter, Solicitudo Re Socialis, which was published in the year 1000, uh, 987, he talked about uh, structures of sin. Now, the notion of structure of sin is the most important concept of this Christian social teaching. What does it mean, structures of sins? Means rules of the game. The Pope said, if the rules of the game are wrong, are unfair, are against the dignity of human being, et cetera, et cetera. There is nothing to be done. Even though you personally try to behave correctly, you personally try to apply your vision of the world, if you are 
working inside the structure which includes the wrong rules of the game, there is nothing to be done. So that is why that notion, which actually was hinted at for the first time by Pope Paul VI, but it was John Paul II who coined that expression. And it is obvious that if these are rules, it is obvious they can be changed otherwise. Finally, a fifth, a fifth avenue to modify the present situation is to remember the notion of integral human development, as it is clearly stated in the encyclical Laudato Si by Pope Francis. Integral human development is meant to be transformational in that it aims to improve people's lives by enhancing their capabilities. So the integral human development approach differs from the conventional approaches to growth. Here, a point of clarification. Why most people confuse growth with development, that is a serious business. Because growth is different from development. Why? Because growth does not apply only to human beings. Even animals grow. Even plants grow. If you have a tree here after here, it becomes taller and taller. What is typical of human beings is the notion of development, a word which comes from Latin, and in Latin, development, you know what does it mean? Getting free of shackles, getting free of all those conditions which do not allow people to flourish. Never forget. So the notion of integral human development, and so you can appreciate the meaning of the adjective integral, comprises three dimensions. One dimension is growth. And growth refers to the material side, which is okay, because we are human beings. And so we need to eat. We have a body to be very, very simple. But there are the other two dimensions, which are the social relational dimension and the spiritual dimension. So a project a, with a, a project aimed at development, if it is able to maintain the three dimensions, namely the quantitative one growth, the social relation, and the spiritual in equilibrium. That is the point. On the other hand, what happens, even in Malta, as well as in my country, that we tend to give more and more and too much importance to growth and forgetting about, for instance, the social relation. What are the consequences? For instance, the destruction of the family. Why the family is in crisis? Tell me why. In the past, it was not like that. Because it is obvious if the only value is to maximize income, to maximize wealth, to maximize uh, the material dimension, it is obvious that you can solve the so-called happiness paradox. But people want to be happy, first of all. And to be happy, they need, of course, uh, food to eat. But uh, food is not eaten per se. It's a mean to an end. The same is true with the spiritual dimension. Oh, spiritual does not mean religious. Eh? Spiritual means that a model of development is such, is an integral human development, if it pays attention to the fact that in a person, there is not only the, the body, but there is also the mind, the mind or the conscience, if you want. So if you organize the, the society in such a way as this uh, uh, problem of equilibration, of keeping in to balance the three dimension, you have the results that every day we observe. And the consequence is what today everybody knows, namely, the increase uh, of the elements uh, of desperation. Now, if you want uh, important reading, go and, and read the book uh, recently published uh, 
è in, 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 Amer in, yes, in America, ma the book has been eh, translated in many languages, for instance in Italian, by Angus Ditton and his wife and Case. Angus Ditton obtained the Nobel Prize in economics and he's American. You know what is the title of the book? If you want to buy and read, be careful because you might not sleep in the night. It's a, the, the title of the book is Death of Despair. Unbelievable, the death of despair. He refers to his country. America is the richest country in the world, but it's the most desperate country in the world. Perhaps you never knew that. Go and check about the rate of suicides. Go and check. Go and read the, uh, in the chat, well, uh, I repeat, Angus Ditton, D-E-A-T-O-N. And the title of the book is Death of Despair, okay? And uh, if you enter, it's, it sells uh, tremendously. Just to give you another example, you know what are homicides, okay? Angus Ditton, yes. Uh, John Caruana, has written properly the name. But uh, you have had uh, John Caruana also the name of his wife, Anne Case, C-A-S-E. And she too is an economist. Uh, she did not obtain the Nobel Prize, but she's also a very good uh, economist, etc. As I, I was saying, the so-called happiness paradox, which was invented or better to say, discovered in the United States in 1974 by Richard Esterly, Richard Esterly, an economist still alive. And he talked about the happiness paradox. To mean what? That beyond a certain threshold of income per capita, further increments of income per capita, instead of increasing the happiness index, decreases it. The curve is like a parabola. The parable is goes up and then goes down inside, and then made a major problem. Why? Hey, because uh, what is the purpose of life? To be happy. Of course, uh, riches are important, but in order. But if to accumulate riches, you forget the horizontal relationship with other people and your spiritual dimension, you become richer but more and more unhappy. And in the book, uh, you read something unbelievable, the use of drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, suicides, uh, and many other dirty things, uh, and homicides. You know, <laughs> consider all the homicides in the world. You know, the, what is the percentage of the global homicides, homicides in the world occur in the United States? 43%. 43% of all homicides, of the homicides, occur in the United States, which is the richest country. And these are figures that you can obtain reading the book I had just quoted. So now, moving towards the conclusion, so we have time, and I will be pleased, pleased to answer your question, whatever they have. Uh, what can I say? I say that today there is a, a strong attention toward the, towards a Christian social teaching. Because people are realizing finally that uh, what is written in various documents is not just sermons or moralistic. No, because what are what is written goes to the uh, to the center, to the center of the uh, of the situation. In other words, addressing the major problems of our society today. And um, I know that until a few decades ago, there were people who were saying, "Well, there is no way to cure capitalism." No, it's not true. And that those same people proposed a revolution. And no. We know today what happened after the revolution. So the only approach which is wise is a transformational approach. We have to transform bit by bit over time 
the major ingredients of the capitalistic system in order to make it humane and not dishumane. That is the, the approach that the Christianity in general, Christianity in general favors, not of throwing away like the revolutionary people uh, of a Marxian type uh, or Mao Zedong type uh, were suggesting by, on the other hand, the transformation of approach. And that is possible, and that is possible. And to conclude, a society in which the principle of fraternity fades uh, from view is a society with no future. That is, a society is not capable of progressing if it is only capable of giving to receive or of giving as a duty. This is why neither the neoliberal individualistic vision of the world in which everything constitutes a trade-off nor the state-centered vision of society where everything is based on a sense of duty can safely lead us out of the shallows where we are. That is why we have to move from a model of social order based on the two pillars of state and market only to a model of social order which is tripolar, state, market, community. And that is, uh, be uh, certain, that is the root uh, of the near future. And when we say community, people might prefer to use a civil society. Never mind. It's not a question of world. The basic idea is that we need uh, three principles, not only two, because the principle within the market is the principle of exchange of equivalence, equivalence of value. The principle guiding the so-called public or state sphere is the, the principle of coercion. The, the, the government issues laws or decrees which are obligatory. But we need the, the third principle if we want to overcome the strictures of our society. That is the principle of reciprocity. So we need the, the exchange of equivalence, no doubt. We need uh, the principle of coercion. For instance, when the government imposes taxes, that is a coercion. But we also need the principle of reciprocity. And uh, the principle of reciprocity is nothing but the, uh, the, the, the so to speak, uh, the translation into real life of the principle of fraternity the principle of it because reciprocity is be careful giving without losing and obtaining without taking away that is the reason why the fratelli tutti which is the last encyclical by pope francis is making such a, a big fuss because we in that encyclical, Pope Francis, without denying, without denying the importance of the other two principles, speaks in favor of the principle of reciprocity, which is uh, the adaptation of the principle of fraternity. So thank you very much for your, uh, 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 perhaps I've spoken even too much. I spoke in uh, 43 minutes. Uh, I beg your pardon, and now I am open to question, remarks, uh, observation, whatever you feel like that. Thank you. Professor Zamani, thanks a lot for this interesting um, lecture. We received uh, already um, a couple of questions from the audience, but I also invite the audience, if they have their questions, to send them to the chat box, and um, I will relay them to you. Um, Maybe the first question um, uh, is with respect to corporate um, uh, social responsibility. And uh, there has been increasing importance for companies to engage in corporate social responsibility. But to a certain extent, the corporate social responsibility is also being used as a marketing tool um, by companies. So to an extent, cor corporate social responsibility is also um, uh, being used as one of the tools of capitalism. What do you think about 
the use of corporate social responsibility um, and the corporate reporting of corporate social responsibility by companies. Thank you. Now, the notion of corporate social responsibility was the notion, the wording, was coined in the year 1953, 53, 54, when a American economist whose name was Herbert Bowen published on the um, Harvard Business Review an article whose title was Corporate Social Responsibility. Since then, this expression entered almost everywhere. In Italy, it arrived a bit later, after a few decades, but nowadays it is taken for granted. Now, the point, my point, is that the notion of social, corporate social responsibility is not enough today. That is the point. It would take another few years to make people understand the point, because people are stubborn. Stubborn means that they when learn something, they do not want to change uh, their mentality. Because the new notion is that uh, of corporate civil responsibility, not social responsibility. Now, the question is, what is the difference? The following. The notion of corporate social responsibility asks the firm or the company, whatever, not to do not to do nasty things, such as uh, exploiting workers, such as polluting, such as evading taxes in the tax heavens, for instance, etc. So the notion of social responsibility is to ask uh, business uh, managers or CEO not to do certain things. Now, today, that is not enough. The notion of corporate civil responsibility ask firms to do certain things, not to not to do. You understand that? For instance, ask to, to do, to, which means to take care of the context or the society where they operate. So if I am a manager of an important uh, uh, company and I have my factory, my laboratory, whatever, in a particular country or in a particular region. And I observe that in that region, the schooling system is not proper or the health system is not working properly. I cannot say to myself, I do not care less. No, because you are operating in that area, you obtain from that community certain advantage, and then you have to cooperate with the other people, with the public authorities and other colleagues like you to solve the problem. That is the point. The point of which, uh, 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 that is the point of which uh, is, uh, became so famous in this uh, pandemic issue. I don't know, but in my country, Italy, a certain number of firms, they took care of that. They didn't say, it is not my business to vaccinate people. Today, not today, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, vaccination is operated inside the firms, inside, because the hospitals were not enough. It would take a long queues. And the firms, uh, they transformed the premises or one type or the other, and uh, of course, uh, uh, nurses and uh, doctors went there to do that. That is an example. Or another example, they are restructuring the schooling system because the state, the government, has not enough resources to restructure, etc. So the, the, the real change today is to move from the corporate social to corporate civil responsibility. Because the notion of responsibility, and in this sense, what is the reference point? The Good Samaritans. Why in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis, at the beginning uses the parable of the Good Samaritan? Tell me, was the Samaritan responsible of what occurred to the poor fellow? Of course not. He was not the cause. 
And so the other two, the priest and the other, the, the other fellow, they did not feel responsible because they did not commit the defect and they passed away. But the good Samaritan, even though he was not responsible directly, he stopped and helped the poor. That is the point that we have, because he was not compelled, the good Samaritan, to do that. Here today is the idea going to the front. And there is a, a growing number of corporations which are understanding this logic, the logic of the good Samaritan. It is not, I say it for the last time, it is not enough not to do bad things. What is required is to do the good things. Thanks, Professor Zamani. Um, we have a question from Kevin Vella, um, um, who asks, what role does the welfare state still play, particularly in the context of globalization? Yes, that is an important question. Again, as you know, welfare state means state. State means government. Eh? The welfare state was born in 1942 in Britain. Lord Beveridge was the one who obtained the consensus at uh, the parliament, Westminster, to pass that. And the idea of the welfare state is the following. The state should take care of their citizens from the cradle to the graves. The famous expression, which is sometimes used even as in other words, the state should take care of the welfare of the citizens. Now, for the first two, three decades, everything went okay. But already in the 80s of last century, immediately two major weaknesses of the welfare, welfare state occurred. The first one is finance. The welfare state is not financially sustainable. And those who know some economics know why. Because the curve of the cost of the welfare services is represented by an exponential curve. The curve representing the revenue out of taxation is a, a similar a, a line with a certain slope. And so over time, the vertical distance between a an exponential curve and the linear curve is doomed to increase. And that is the reason why, for instance, consider Italy. Until 1980, the Italian government had no debt, no debt. And nowadays the debt is huge, as you know, but not only for the pandemic. And don't make the mistake of silly people who say the fault, no, because the debt started in the 80s, in the last 40 years. The second reason of the crisis of the welfare state is of a moral nature. The first reason is financial. The second, moral. Why? Because the welfare state delegitimized the role of the principle of fraternity. Because people said, if it is the state which should take care of the needs of the necessity of people, of everybody, why should I take care? If I observe a poor, why should I help the poor? I direct the poor to the government or to the offices, etc., etc. So that is uh, obvious in many countries where the so-called horizontal relations among people were very strong. Now, today, the issue is we have to move from the welfare state to the welfare society. That is the slogan, welfare society, because it is the entire society which should take care of the needs of people. And within the society, you have the state, you have the corporations, you have third sector, third sector uh, entities what is called non-profit organization of their sector. In other words, uh, the basic idea of the welfare society is the principle of subsidiarity. Unless we opera, we put into operation the principle of subsidiarity, otherwise there will be nothing to be done. Because the government,
cannot exceed a certain threshold in terms of financing. But corporations, they have the money. I, I, I assure you, and they have big money, even too much. And so that money, but what is the rule? When I talk to big managers, they tell me, they say to me, we are happy to contribute, to give uh, big money for the bird. But we need, or better to say, we want uh, to be involved. We do not accept uh, that the politician decides and then they, we have to pay what they have decided. If you want our money, we have to cooperate what is called the co-planning. And in Italian, we say co-progettazione, co-programmazione. Because in other words, it is the whole society that should take care of the needs. And that is the, 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 the path which is being, in particular in Europe, taken in, into serious consideration. We have another question. Conclude, the uh, universalistic uh, uh, characterization of the welfare state should remain. Universally means no discrimination of no type. The point is what we have to change is not the ideal, but the governance. People confuse government with governance, which are two different concepts. Thanks. Um, we have another question from uh, Roger Fudge, and I'm going to read it verbatim. How relevant or different is this model of society to the concept of the social market economy? Uh, sorry, say it again. Is the difference? How relevant or different is this model of society different to the concept of social market economy? Now, the notion of social market economy, as you know, it's a particular model of organization of the society, which was um, elaborated in the interwar period, last century, in, mainly in Fribourg, Switzerland, and then Germany, and then Austria. And uh, after the war, the Second World War, was uh, the model that uh, a leader like Adenauer adopted uh, in his country, and it was a, a successful model, no doubt. Of course, uh, the question that most people should ask is, why the social market economy, which had a great success, no, nobody disputed that, did not uh, expand elsewhere? Why? Ask yourself, if a model has a success, why other countries such as Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, etc., did not uh, follow suit. That is the way. The reason is that the conditions, now I have no time to elaborate, so I limit myself to the statement. The conditions, the structural and institutional conditions, which are necessary in order to make the social market economy function, are conditions that in countries different from Germany do not exist. And that is uh, linked to the philosophical matrix. Because unless you know some philosophy, you cannot understand certain things. Because you know that the philosophical matrix of the German culture is Kantism. Kant is the inventor of deontologies. England, as I said before at the beginning of my speech, is the country of utilitarianism. And utilitarianism is just the opposite of countries. On the other hand, countries like Italy or even Spain, they have another philosophical matrix, which is a virtue ethics, going back to Aristotle and St. Thomas, virtue ethics. So it is obvious that if you pretend to transpose a model which was born in a particular territory, having a particular mentality, cultural mentality, into a country where the metrics, cultural metrics is different, cannot work. That is the point. The same is true if you go to Japan. To Japan, 
a model like social market cannot possibly work, which does not mean that that model is wrong. It's perfectly, but it's perfectly okay for that context, for that context. That is the point. When um, I give you an example, a concrete example, Pope Benedict XVI, he's intelligent or not? Of course he's intelligent. He's a great theologist, theologians, philosopher, and he's German, okay? When he wrote a, his encyclical, encyclical Caritas in Veritate, which was published in the year 2009, uh, the question was raised to him, why in that encyclical signed by you, you German Pope, you never mentioned social market economy? Try to answer. Because he said, because I'm the Pope, I cannot uh, propose something which comes from the experience of one country, although an important country. I have to speak to the, all the people in the world. And so he knew, because he's a man of great culture, great culture. I'm, I was amazed, even though he never studied economics, when I talked to him about certain economic concepts, he understood everything. And that is because he's really intelligent. And he said, I, if I propose that, I would not help cultures consider Latin America, for instance, or African countries. It would not possible. That is the, the answer to the question. So that is a model which has a, its points of strength, a force, and it did very well. The second remark is the following, that that model presupposes national economies. But in an epoch of globalization, the social market economies enters into crisis. And you understand why? Because if, the, if you talk about of a closed economy, the government of that country dominates. But in a globalized world, you know the implication. That is uh, the reason. Of course, you might say, but you're, Yes, because people use a social market economy, not in the strict sense of the word. They use like a market economy, paying attention to the social affairs. But that is not the social market economy. The social market economy is a particular model stemming from a particular philosophical, theoretical setup. Okay? Thanks a lot, Professor Zamani. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we need to bring this lecture to a close. Thanks goes to Professor Zamani for delivering an interesting lecture, to Newsbook for having collaborated with the Maltese Young Christian Workers to set up the logistics for this lecture, and to you, the audience, for having attended this lecture. Finally, I encourage you to follow the Maltese Young Christian Worker Facebook page to keep updated with the events of the group, including details of our next lecture. Thank um, you. Thanks again. And good Thank night. Thank you to you. And many, many wishes to you all of you. I hope to be able to come to see, to visit your beautiful uh, island, which I like very much. And I would have preferred uh, shaking my hands with you. But it will come that day, perhaps next year. Okay? Thanks, all the thanks best. a lot for your nice words. Good all night. And and thanks a lot. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.